There's nothing in that, or there was nothing in that, to say that the speakers themselves must have the notion of error. Whereas you're now saying, what I thoroughly agree with, that they must indeed themselves conceive of the possibility of being wrong. That's absolutely right. Uh, uh, at, at, at that earlier point, uh, I, I wasn't... Uh, I simply came in at a later stage. Mm -hmm. that, that is, I, I, I was, as you say, taking for granted that oh, the party's mm -hmm. <laughs> interpreter and interpretee had the, the mm -hmm. concept, had meanings, and yeah, so yeah, forth. Yeah. Uh, and it was just throwing uh, light on on a, a much more modest mm. <laughs> question, right. uh, though not all that modest, uh, but but more modest. That's right. Uh, the more modest question uh, uh, what is it about speech and action uh, that make them interpretable mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there my interest was much more in the holism uh, I mean how much we actually have to understand if we're going to understand anything mm -hmm. uh, and the interrelation between belief desire meaning and so forth was in the forefront, uh, but I, I'm happy to say, uh, I mean, in, in agreement with you, I didn't appreciate uh, uh, the the problem. I wasn't thinking about it. Uh, the problem of accounting for or giving any sort of account at all of how we get the concept of error. Mm -hmm. And, and therefore of objectivity and of truth and, and all the rest. Right. Yeah. I, I, right. And uh, uh, yes, this, this, this has come to dominate my interest now, but it certainly didn't then. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's, it's essential to uh, attribute a grasp of the concepts of error, concept yeah. of error, or concepts of right and being right and being wrong having said something yeah. right, said something wrong, mm -hmm. uh, to the speakers. Uh, because if it's just a description of, as it were, a natural phenomenon, there are these speakers who make these noises and behave in certain mm -hmm. ways, mm -hmm. then it seems to me that invoking the concept of error to explain the mismatch between your theory and what is observed is just like, well, you've got a a theory of gravitation, right. and then the planets don't quite, <laughs> uh, uh, the, their movements don't quite accord with this theory, and then you say, well, the planets make some errors. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, I think that's right. I mm. think that's, that's, that is the right way to put it. Mm. Uh, it, it it's like um, uh, saying that a dog has made a mistake uh, uh, I mean, if, if, if it uh, doesn't obey your order or, mm -hmm. or it's hunting for something that goes in, the, in what we would say is the wrong direction. Yeah, right. uh, but it hasn't got the idea that it's making a mistake. No, quite. Uh, sure. <laughs> it's we who have the idea that it's making a mistake. Yeah. No, I, 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 I think that's absolutely true. Mm -hmm. <coughs> now, I want to pursue this. Uh, <coughs> see, it seems to me that if you want to explain the genesis of the notion of error, or even what it is to grasp the notion, you have to talk about the activity of giving, of defending, or giving reasons for. I mean, this is a <coughs> salient feature of language. Someone says something, somebody else refuses to accept it or challenges it, then you give reasons for it, offer grounds for it, perhaps he offers grounds against. So, reasons for, reasons against. <coughs> I, I don't see that it's possible to explain what it is or how we come to grasp the notion of being wrong in what one said or being, or being proved right. Uh, without an account of these parts of language use. I don't know if you would agree with this or, or, or not. Well, 
uh, well, I certainly would agree that if, if you're in a position to do that, uh, to ask for reasons, mm. uh, then you certainly already have got the concept of error. You've got thought and propositions. And if you can entertain propositions, you've got the concept of error. Uh, uh, so there's a sense in which I think that would certainly be a sign uh, that you had it. But, but as an account of how you got it, it seems to me to come very late. I mean, it's as mm -hmm. if you're already speaking uh, uh, and your words already have a content. Uh, and, and, and so now somebody asks you, why do you think that? I mean, you couldn't ask that question or answer it unless you had a language and, oh, no, and meaning and the concept of objectivity and truth and so forth. So I don't see how that could be an explanation of how we got it. Well, I'm not sure about that. It seems to me that as you acquire language, one of the things you slowly learn to do is to give reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, uh, it doesn't mean to say you have to have full-fledged notion of a reason for or no. a ground for mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, but you're taught this practice if someone says, how do you know or why do you say? You've got to answer and you're taught what counts as a, or you've come to learn what counts as a reasonable answer for various different cases. Uh, so I, I, I uh, I mean, we have the very early stages. The child doesn't have the notion of, <coughs> of, of a reason for something, or even the notion of being right or wrong. He may be correct, he says something. Yes. But uh, <coughs> um, so it seems to me that. Uh, I mean, if we're describing what you have to have to grasp a language, and what in particular you have to have to grasp the meanings of particular sentences, this practice of giving reasons for and against is something that has to be invoked. It's a practice, of course, within the language, and people who engage in it are people who speak the language, or speak part of the language at least, already, but if the language didn't have that practice embedded within it, if the practice of speaking the language didn't allow for challenging, defending, giving reasons, giving reasons against and so on, then we should have, well, start with a very impoverished notion of error, 